All right, I want to go ahead and get started, Ellie. Yeah, Since let's we're do running it. running the PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm just going to not click things. That's going to be my deal. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody. We'll introduce ourselves. You want to go first? Or you well, you're, to... you're first on I'm the on thing. the thing. All right, I'm Stephanie Towns. I'm a missioner for Congregational Vitality, Youth for Youth and Young Adult. And we have matching mugs. I love our matching mugs back from when we were in the office together. And I'm pretty sure are, my mug is still there, like in the office. It is. It, I saw it when I went and ventured. <laughs> Did <laughs> Covered with a fine layer of dust. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm Ellie Singer. I'm social media and multimedia specialist at the Diocese of Texas. Um, and I'm very excited that everybody's here. So excited that you're joining us. Um, so we are going to start after introductions. Okay, so our second start. Um, <laughs> Stephanie found one of the most incredible prayers I've ever heard, and it's for communicating. Um, and so here it is. The Lord be with you. And also with you. God who wrote your words on tablets of stone with fingers of fire. God who gave your word the chief cornerstone with hands of flesh. Help us who write with fingers of flesh through sparks of fire to break open hearts of stone. Amen. Amen. So it's our hope that uh, through this webinar, we'll sort of start conversation about how to, how to bring the word to the internet in interesting ways and form online community. Um, so I guess we have to start with why. Um, why are we even talking about um, the internet, right? And I think some things are gonna be obvious, but some things might not be as obvious. Uh, so first of all, digital life is not going away. <laughs> um, it's it's uh, to use a really overused phrase, right? The new normal, but it's been the new normal for like 15 years and we're kind of just now catching up. So not only is digital life not going away, but it is just life. Um, and so I think, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory, but we need to think about, you know, where are people living these days? It's part of that is communicating with each other digitally. And I'm also going to name you, Deli, Ellie, as a digital native. That's a more natural space to be than um, those of us who didn't grow up with the internet and remember those AOL CDs that were mailed to our houses and um, and evolved with uh, with the internet. So, yeah, I truly do not know what you just said, um, <laughs> but I trust you. <laughs> it was a thing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's different. It's different. And so um, we need to, we need to learn how to be in this new communication style. So it's not a new world, right? It's made of the same people who exist in analog life. Um, but it is a new communication style with new expectations. So another reason that we want to talk about digital life is that we've already seen the benefits in 2020. I mean, we've been forced by calamity to move largely online. And that is tragic. At the same time, um, we found that our ministry is newly accessible and not just um, in terms of physical accessibility. Um, it's, it, I mean, it, that's important, right? People can actually make it to services. People who are homebound can actually participate and that's really, really cool. Um, another aspect of that accessibility is that um, reaching out online in an authentic way that makes sense for the platform um, speaks to people who are already there in a new way and it, it, it increases accessibility to people who are native to the internet. Um, obviously, it's also super convenient. I love going to church in my pajamas. Same, same. It's love, great. Love having, yeah, pajamas and coffee and church in yeah. the morning. Or, you know, being able to just say, hey, I know that this morning prayer happens somewhere every day. Let me just log on today of all days. I need it, right? Um, safety, obviously. We're keeping each other healthy. Um, and then maintaining those long distance connections with parishioners who maybe moved away or a college student who's starting a new life somewhere and 
hasn't quite found their footing in their new city, they can still connect with their church community back home. Um, so it's not just that we have to be online because that's where people are. Like there is a new horizon of possibilities out there um, that we're just starting to crack open in 2020 and it's really exciting. And um, throughout history, technology has changed the way that we've done church. I, that we would not have the New Testament or the church if it hadn't been the, for the technology of Roman roads. We would not have the Protestant Re Reformation of both Martin Luther or the um, English Reformation. I mean, we, I can't imagine having a Book of Common Prayer without the printing press, like that's kind of important. Um, so that allowed both of those things to flourish. And now we're in the midst of this new technology that we're figuring out. And we haven't quite figured out all of the possibilities, but there are glimmers of it, um, of how we're doing it. And, the, and this pandemic has created the, um, has encouraged us even more to dive into what this new technology shift can allow. So it's exciting um, and scary, and um, but it, we're it, we're on the frontier, so we can just be explorers. Yeah, we we can try new things. I'm sure not everything that Christians made in that printing press when it first came out stuck. <laughs> no, but we also got the Book of Common Prayer right, and and new translations of the Bible. So it's a great time to experiment. So I'm going to open up a poll. Um, let's see here. Launch polling. It should pop up. You view your questions. So what 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 are new to your what has what technologies are new to your church your communities since um, the current pandemic began? We threw in a whole bunch. Um, yeah, a lot of new Zoom. We all learned so much about Zoom. YouTube's new, online giving new, that's an important thing. Slack, oh cool, people are playing with Slack. A Discord even, we got a Discord answer, Ellie, yay. Yes, <laughs> love Discord. Yeah, so people are trying new things and we need to celebrate that. Like none of us ever expected to be on Zoom as much as we are now. I used it for a handful of meetings for across distance, but yeah. And YouTube, that's what do you, what do you say about YouTube, Ellie, that it's the number two search engine? Isn't yeah, the... yeah. After Google, YouTube is the um, second most popular search engine. Sorry, Bing. Um, but people <laughs> just type their questions into YouTube and they find answers that are very personal because you can see the person there sharing it with you. I mean, YouTube is also owned by Google. So technically, it's still Google is the number one search engine. But We'll break it down a little bit. All right. We'll end um, that poll. Mark Wilkinson asked, are you going to explain all these platforms? Um, and in this webinar, we're not going to dive in specifically to each of these platforms. We're going to be talking about how at any technology level um, and using any platform, you can form community with a few um, interesting principles and, and ways of um, communicating things like always having next steps, that sort of stuff. If you want to dive deeper into these platforms, I actually suggest uh, using YouTube. Um, if, you, if you want a, a sort of breakdown of how to do interesting things on Zoom, I mean, what even is Discord? A lot of people don't know. Just uh, search literally, what is Discord? Um, and somebody there will already have a webinar um, that's gonna do it way more justice than we could do today. Um, and if you have more questions, we're really available. Um, I, I encourage you to email us, probably me for that kind of question, um, after the webinar, but thanks for the question. All right. Moving All on. right. So on to part two, I'm flipping over my little piece of paper guide. Uh, God is with us. Um, so we're going to root ourselves in a little bit of scripture here. And we're going to be using, uh, first King 17 verses 8 through 16, um, the widow of Zarephath. So I'm literally going to read this um, and feel free to read along with me. When the word of the Lord came to him saying, and this is Elijah, 
um, saying, go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug, and now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go and do as I have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. So uh, this is a really interesting passage about welcome because I think it kind of captures a lot of what is uniquely difficult about welcome as we're, as we're approaching this new place, right? Um, God commands us to welcome people where they are, just like God commanded um, this widow to welcome Elijah. And then we, like the widow, look around and we say, I'm sorry, what? I don't have the budget. I don't have the technology. Like, how are we going to pull this together? I'll um, have her a few sticks. Right, right. What are we going to get when we, all, we don't even have, we don't have anything. Um, and so then God recognizes that fear. Like the widow is seen just like we are seen. Um, and God promises abundance. And then the widow having faith says, all right, well, I'll give it my best shot. And then God follows through. So this is the promise. Like it's in scripture, right? We have, we can look around and have all of our doubts and everything, but where God pushes us to go, we'll have what we need. Um, and I, it's just so beautiful. I love this passage. Thanks for picking it out, Steph. Yeah. And now we're going to do um, something. We're going to try something different. We have Alexio Divina that we have through Poll Everywhere. So hopefully technology will work. We're trying this too. And it will share my screen. So, um, so here you can go to pollev.com. Poll, um, slash Stephanie T O W five two three, or you can text Stephanie T O W five two three to two two three three three, and it should show your responses. So a word or a phrase from this passage that's speaking to you. We're gonna try digital Lexio to be. And if you have any questions about how this works, um, let us know in the chat. Can't read the text. Yeah, it probably is very small. It's the same text that we just went over, so maybe a phrase jumps out to you. Emptied. Damn. Yeah. Afraid. Die. 
die. Yeah, when she says, I'm just going to go and die, like it just hurts my heart. First. Make little, yeah. And I'm assuming that giant emptied is coming from the phrase, uh, the jar of meal was not emptied. Mm -hmm. or the jug of oil did not fail. Mm -hmm. All right, Ellie, I think we got some answers. But, um, you wanna share your screen again? Oh yeah. Oh, you're gonna have to um, end your screen share. I think okay. it's not. There we go. So you're the host. Got it. Oh, it was going to be so smooth. Okay. <laughs> That's still pretty. On to part three. Yeah. It's good. Um, what does it mean to be welcoming? Um, so I have a funny story to start us off. Welcome looks different in different places. Um, and here's just an example of that. So I was going to visit, um, my, my partner and I were gonna go visit his uh, family. And immediately I was like, okay, so we have to go to HEB to get, you know, all the fixings for the smoked salmon. And he's like, what? <laughs> we're just gonna drive up to, to see my family. And I'm like, um, what? Like every time in my family, which is a fairly Jewish family by heritage, um, every time you visit somebody, you bring smoked salmon. It's like, it's like this thing that you, it's totally expected. You bring bagels, you bring smoked salmon, you bring spreads. Um, and it wouldn't be a welcome or hospitality without that sign. But then in that moment of saying, okay, so, so we should go to HEB right now, um, had that sort of culture clash of like, uh, what? Actually, that is kind of crazy that we would bring smoked salmon, like a fish to each other. Like, what kind of welcome is that? That's very strange. Um, it's very and so Jewish. sometimes you have, it's very Jewish. Yeah, yeah. And he's very Protestant. So I'm like, oh, yeah, actually, now that you pointed out, that is like an interesting quirk. So uh, this, this part is sort of an invitation to um, look at your kind of welcome and see how that can match up in different ways to um, the, the people you're welcoming um, and what other people are attending your church for and especially online church. Yeah, we often assume that we all have the same definition of welcome. I mean, it sounds like we throw, away, like we throw around the term all the time, but there actually are, that welcome means different things to different people and it's often by context. So, in our urban context, which we have some big urban contexts in our diocese, that means radical inclusivity of all people. Like um, many of our urban congregations have floats in the in the Houston and Austin Pride parades. That's the kind of in, that's the kind of welcome that they're expecting in urban contexts. Often, not always. This is general generalities, of course. But in rural or even more suburban areas, what they're looking for is a warm feeling but not smothering like where they you're the first visitor they they've seen in forever um and they attack you um with they do that with young people right ellie have you ever had that happen no of course not <laughs> um so um you know that we have some lovely congregations that do this well um one in um in our congregation in Hearn will teach people if they come a few minutes early to the service how to participate and what our liturgy is like but they're not going to harass you with phone calls afterwards so that's the kind of balance between warm but not smothering that we're talking about there and these two phrases come from a study right yes um, from uh, sociology of religion folks 
cool. Yeah. And so when we, when we become, uh, when we, when we step into digital life, we suddenly find that our reach isn't just our local neighborhood where we all have the same norms. So you might be talking to people who are coming from all sorts of different phrases about how they would describe welcome. And it gets a little bit more complicated culturally. Mm -hmm. um, here's a piece of scripture that we thought fit really well here. Um, For the people of those regions report about us, what kind of welcome we had among you. Um, that is to say, different kinds of welcome in different places and contexts that's been around in Christian evangelism from the very beginning um, and adjusting the way that we are with each other and, and celebrating some new ways of welcome is part of our heritage. So we have another poll that I will start. Um, so which definition of, like we're curious, uh, which definition of welcome resonates with you? I'll give people a See, it's like well. your welcome, like it's your welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little, a little piece. Well, just about everybody. People a minute or two, a second or two to finish voting. And we will show the results. So, Mostly people resonate with warm but not smothering, but we still have some people among us that radically inclusive is where they resonate. So it's even among us in our diocese and beyond, we have some Fond du Lac people here. Um, we have variation on what that means. Yeah, and so if Stephanie and I were trying to sit down and, um, and make a welcoming community out of the people here, right? Let's say we just decided that this was gonna be our community everybody on this call, I had answered um, radical inclusivity because personally that resonates for me. If I had just assumed that that was right for everybody, I would have been wrong. Um, I would not have known that that resonated for most people. So part of this is like getting direct feedback just like that. Like what, what to you is most welcoming? What could we do better? You know, um, it's always good to know. So here's some food for thought. Um, and Stephanie, this was your question, right? Oh yeah, um, you know, why do people are coming to visit your church online for different reasons? And often they, they're dealing with some sort of crisis. I mean, we are all dealing with a lot of stress under this pandemic. So, you know, just be cognizant of that. You know, maybe someone's struggling with something in their home life or, um, let, you know, they're, they're coming to you for a reason. Um, they're looking for, for spiritual nourishment. And just be, be cognizant of that as you think about how you're welcoming people, so. Yeah, um, one interesting aspect of digital life is that it's a lot easier to say hard things just via text. So I guarantee that if you literally ask people, like leave the door open for open answers to this question via email or something like that, and you just say, why are you here? What brought you here today? I guarantee you're gonna get some emails um, and they'll be so helpful. And they're not something that you could necessarily do in person because people aren't as brave in having that personal conversation. Now we're digging into some more nuts and bolts. Um, so we're going to talk about the three T's, T, T, T. See how it has three T's in the title? <laughs> then, yeah, it's nice. Um, transferring, translating, and transforming. So let's start with uh, transferring. I think you've probably seen this meme before. So we'll take Bikini Bottom and just push it somewhere else. So the uh, first step is just, OK, we got to get church online. Let's go. Let's take what we're doing, and we'll, we'll put it online. Right, we'll have a Zoom, let's do this. Um, so some really obvious examples of that are in people's roles. Um, and usually this comes across in who is visible at worship, right? Uh, you take your priest from the church setting and you put them online, right? You have a live stream. You it might include deacons or lectors or um, introduce musicians and choirs. 
uh, that kind of thing. Sometimes though, we forget about also translating the more infrastructure roles to online settings, um, having online ushers, having an online sexton to do upkeep on your website, right? Um, if you, you do upkeep on your building, also do upkeep on your website. Um, Alter Guild, that might be graphic design, that might be inviting the Alter Guild to put together something that reads really, really well on sort of a smaller screen personal setting for your online worship um, admins, etc. So leaving this part with a little bit of food for thought, I also, wow. I'll interrupt one second. I also heard someone use a digital verger that was like the person who kept the Zoom Zoom bombers from being problematic. So like you could even oh, translate so a verger into a digital space, so. Wow, digital vergers should also have staffs. Yes, they like absolutely should. Yeah, just because you have that role. That's so good. Yeah, it's in security. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, think about, you know, what, what is just transferring to the online world and what things maybe have we overlooked when we're transferring ourselves um, to this part of life, right? If you were to set up a new church in an area that is like vast empty plains, what would you build there and what roles would you come up with? It's sort of the same thing, but digital. So this also extends to sort of concepts like, what does it mean to be a member at a digital church, right? Um, we talk a lot about membership in physical churches, like who signs up, who fills out the card, you know? Um, so what is the equivalent of a newcomer welcome card uh, in your online church? Um, and how does one become a member of a church that they don't set foot in? I don't have the answer, but I bet there's some interesting ones out there and we'll leave that for you to brainstorm with. All right, so the next step would be to translate and Ellie has this great picture of William Tyndall, the our translator to English of uh, the Bible. Um, but so there are things that make different sense in a digital space than uh, in regular, like Ellie mentioned using the altar guild as a, for a, a smaller screen. That's gonna look different than if you're in a massive cathedral where you need huge, you know, uh, flower arrangements. It's gonna, it's gonna look different. Um, but there's other things to consider. Um, some of you said that you use, you're using online giving for the first time and how, and not just that, but you know, how do you include the offertory in a, in a way that's complementary, that complements the service? Um, digit, people's attention spans are shorter, so prob an hour-long service feels really long online. So think about shortening it, maybe have a short, fewer readings. Um, um, and then uh, prioritizing authenticity over polish. This is a, this is a generational thing, but um, if you think about how unpolished TikTok, if anyone's familiar with TikTok, um, over a really polished um, professional video, um, or even think about like Brene Brown. She says we connect in our authenticity. It, that that happens online too. Um, we connect where we're authentic and real, and less so if we're polished and um, closed off. So um, there are things that we can do to translate our services um, from into the medium. So Ellie, you have any thoughts on that? Section. Yeah, it, uh, it strikes me that that kind of removes a lot of pressure too, that we don't need to have the like, I don't know, Joel Osteen level production value, right? Um, we're setting out to connect authentically in Christian community with each other. And that can be messy and it should be messy. It should be people bringing their whole selves to each other. Um, and it doesn't, you know, so let's see less about like getting the right vestments and more about really showing up for each other. I so mean, don't no, worry. Pretty vestments are nice too. Okay, they are really nice. <laughs> they are. Um, but how does, a, how does a bells and whistles church service read on screen? It becomes very flat. Um, 
connection online is much more about like personal face-to-face -face connection. Um, a lot of YouTube is just based on like one person sitting there talking directly to the viewer, right? Um, that would be kind of weird if you found entertainment by like meeting up with one person and it's just the two of you in a room and they're like showing you how to sew clothes from the 1800s. Like that's not a normal thing, but it is a normal thing. And they get millions of views on those kinds of videos on YouTube because on screens, we can be much more personal with each other. So number three is transformation. This is the big one. This is what gave us the Book of Common Prayer, right? So it would have been pretty easy um, with the printing press to say, all right, so we'll just start printing all these things that we've been transcribing by hand and it'll stay in Latin and, you know, we'll just, it'll be a little bit easier for us. But innovators created so much new stuff that could not have existed before. And the BCP was one of them. It's this idea that now that we can actually mass produce um, books, so many, we can actually create something that people can have, um, that can sort of democratize worship in a whole new way and can give people more uh, entrances, I guess, into Christian life. Um, we can do that kind of stuff now. I don't know what it's gonna look like, but it's really exciting that we get to be at that sort of printing press moment, right? We have this whole new way of talking to each other. What is the new thing that we're gonna do? So part of that is already happening. Um, we have, and I'll just skip to the bottom for this concrete example, synchronous and asynchronous conversation. So right now, this, this is synchronous, what we're doing right now. We're talking to each other. We could easily have done this um, before pandemic times in a room with each other, right? Um, it might've actually been really nice because I could have seen all of your beautiful faces. Um, not that your face isn't beautiful, Stephanie, but it would have been oh, great to have everybody sorry. together. <laughs> um, but then asynchronous conversation is something really interesting. I guess before I, I'm going to, I'm really going to talk about the past that I haven't lived through, but like before, I don't know what you'd do. Would you like send letters? You would like, right? Yeah. They, I don't really know how you would carry on these kinds of long distance conversations. I guess that's what pen pals are anyway. Yeah, that's what pen pals are, really. Okay. <laughs> but um, in the digital world, that's like you have a group chat with people. You're on Discord hanging out with each other. You send a text and you don't expect a response. A response might come the next day and you kind of carry on these slow trip conversations with each other. So in that new setting, what kinds of formation opportunities are there? What kinds of evangelism opportunities are there? Um, and then how do you welcome people into those new spaces? It's really cool. Um, so in general, when we're developing these transformative ideas, we have to think about what is our mission and work backwards from that. The Book of Common Prayer wasn't transforming the Latin mass. It was working from the mission and looking at our resources and working backwards from that and saying, what can we do with this technology to invite more people to our way of Christian life? Um, and a big aspect of this is also digital co-creation, that we can't come up with this on our own. No individual can. Um, and we need to invite a lot of people to the table to bring their crazy, wacky ideas so we can experiment and uh, try new things. This is always getting feedback, always inviting people to share their ideas. So now we have another, okay. Um, another poll everywhere. So I'm going to do this again and activate it. So um, what's one new idea you might think you might implement in your community from, from our discussion? We're trying new things too. Yay. So again, um, poll pollev.com slash Stephanie TOW523 or text Stephanie TOW523 to 2233. Kelly, are you voting? Yes, I am. That's why I'm like being kind of quiet. I'm like <laughs> going to the thing. 
Of course I'm voting. I love voting. <laughs> That's a commentary on 2020. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any opportunity to get out the vote. Um, it says that your presentation is underway and as soon as the activity is active, you'll see it on the screen here. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, oh, I have to, I have to actually click activate. Okay. There. Oh, there they are. Oh, okay. Beautiful. You're considering discord. Developing. Diocesan. Co-creation, co love that. We'll reevaluate goals. Give us five minutes that I get to do this. Great. These are so fun. I love these little clouds. Yeah. Yeah, roles. Yeah, mm -hmm. taking a look at at who does what and where. Mm -hmm. Alter guild, reevaluate, asynchronous. Yeah, there's all sorts of things you can do asynchronously, um, especially around formation, and um, that can be really great. All right, you want me to stop sharing so you can do the- Yes, oh, please. Oh, and so many people cool story. Maybe that was so much good stuff. All right, we're gonna stop. Yay, <gasps> story time. I loved that. Whoever said story time, that's so good. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is our final of our five acts webinar, uh, social risk. Um, so here's the deal. Church is socially risky. And that can, that actually, I mean that in a couple different ways. First of all, in our very secular world, it can be very socially risky to even go to church. Church tends to have a bad rap. Um, we're just going to admit it. And not in every circle, not in every town, right? But it tends to be that people are distrustful of church, and that's a legacy that we um, have to acknowledge. So, and, it's, uh, and that's even more so for younger generations than it is for older generations. I mean, that yes, too. that is true. That's the case. Um, so if I want to invite a friend to church, they might be embarrassed to admit to other people that they went with me to church. And on top of that, if they, of their own uh, volition want to go back to church, which I think is really great, they're going to have to overcome that sort of sense of embarrassment. Also, um, church is socially risky, just like any other group of people is. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've ever shown up at a party without a plus one where you don't really know anybody, you know that feeling, right? Of, oh goodness, I have to spend the next hour here talking to people and I don't really have a way in. Even if you're an extrovert, that's a lot of small talk, right? And um, mm -hmm. you have to decide how much, how real am I gonna be here? How much am I gonna put myself out on the line? And that can be stressful. So we're really excited about church. We know our own communities and we're comfortable in them, but we need to remember that at every step of welcoming, there is discomfort. So in my head, I've broken it down into like this fun little triangle. And so I'm going to share my fun little triangle with I you. I love Ellie's triangle. <laughs> I call it the triangle of social risk. Um, and you got to go step by step. And this specifically applies to online communities, but I think it kind of draws on just the way people work in general. Um, so imagine you are on this path to being really involved in this community. Where do you start? Um, you start completely anonymously. None of you know each other. And maybe you see an ad on Instagram, maybe your friend DMs you some thing that's going on and invites you, right? You DM start direct message for those older than Ellie. Yes, direct message, sends you a text um, about this new thing that's going on. They send the invitation, but you show up anonymously. Like if you see a church's Instagram post, that's an anonymous interaction, but you're still kind of belonging to that community a little bit more. Maybe you're following that church on Instagram. The next level of uh, interaction is text. So that would be commenting on that Instagram post, watching a Facebook Live and actually interacting in the comments, submitting your prayer request, um, maybe even submitting an interest card um, in somebody's Google form. The next level of social risk is pretty intense. 
This is video and voice chat. This is saying, okay, I've seen this content. I've gotten kind of involved by commenting on things. I'm going to take a dive and I'm actually going to show up to this Zoom meeting, this like Zoom Compline, let's say. I'm going to show my face to these relative strangers, say hello, um, and be vulnerable. And then finally, we have co-creation. And this is something that I think sometimes we lack, honestly, in the institutional mainline church, is that constant invitation to lay people to go out and do something. Like you can make church happen too. You can make communities too. Um, and so this is the invitation to those who have gotten really involved in the community to make something themselves in that community. This could be starting up um, a, a Bible study that they're really interested in. Um, this could be taking over maybe some social media accounts. Um, it could even be starting like- Starting a Discord channel right now. Starting a Discord channel. Um, or it could even be uh, crowdsourcing ideas, right? Um, testing the waters by literally sending out a poll and saying like, hey, would you guys be interested in covering this topic later? Um, and allowing people to have their voices heard. That is especially important in online communities. It's important in analog, but in online communities, if you don't feel like you're contributing to a community, you're really not a member because it's like watching something on TV. Um, it's, it's, it's the difference between watching a game show and being on the game show. And one of those sounds way more fun. Um, <laughs> So a couple things to remember with this. It's an invitation to a braver and braver space. It doesn't take a lot to invite people to follow your Instagram account. But imagine immediately walking up to a stranger and saying, hey, do you want to start a Discord channel for me? Like that is insane. So you have to introduce safety at each step. And that means covenants. And online, it's so important have expectations and rules around your community spaces so that people know what they're getting into and know that they're safe. Uh, a really good example is in Discord servers. Um, you have to agree to rules to interact. Um, in Facebook groups, you have to agree to rules and there are moderators and you can actually lose your privileges to being in that Facebook group if you start um, like spouting hate speech and insulting people and going off the deep end, which people tend to do online. Um, this is what I, this is what I usually say about this. Um, we've existed in analog world for thousands and thousands of years, and we have created some sort of social rules about that. We have existed on the internet for a couple decades, and we're still creating those social rules and expectations. So it's important to really set about creating explicit covenants with rules and assigning people to follow up about those rules at every step of the way. But you also need to send out an invitation. Invitations are never implied. Only maybe for true go-getters who are like clamoring at the door to get in. But in general, um, you have to send out an invitation. And that means an actionable next step. That means a link, right? If you're following somebody on Instagram anonymously uh, and, and they say, please comment below, what do you think about this question? That's an invitation to text. Then maybe later they send out a, hey, there's a link in our bio for this Zoom chat that's gonna happen. Um, you can register here. That's the invitation to the next step. And then finally, the invitation to co-creation is perhaps that survey I talked about earlier or um, literally saying, hey, I see you and I know you as an individual and I think your gifts and talents would be so valuable right here. P.S. That also takes something off your plate. <laughs> so it's pretty great for everybody. And as um, uh, someone in the chat said, co-creation means you have to give up your tight control, which is also true. So very, true. Very true. So true. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think we have time to go into it. Um, in this webinar, but look up, um, uh, oh gosh, what is the farming technique that I always go on about? Permaculture. Permaculture. Yeah. I'm like, I talk about it all the time, but I didn't remember <laughs> it right then. Look up permaculture. 
Um, and specifically, this is going to be sound a little weird. Specifically, look up milpa, M I L P A. It's a farming technique that um, instead of looking at the ground and saying, I'm going to mow this into these rows and plant corn, it says, What grows naturally here and how can I help it to grow and not have tight control, but actually have way more nutrients and resources come out of that plot of land because of it. So look it up. It's really cool. So someone asked in the chat or mentioned in the chat that um, the challenge is to help our greatest generation members wrap our mind around all of this and they assume a normative culture. So I'm going to give you a couple of other frameworks to kind of think through like how you might describe this. So one way is like we are we all become we start out as strangers and then the goal is um, eventually to be neighbors so to move from disconnected to connected or wanderers to wanderers where um we're individuals wandering around but we come together and we wander together in community um so it, and um it, you know there's the point is though always think about next steps and always um, always remember that it does take it is a brave step each time you do take it it's not necessarily natural and they do need invitations personal invitations even in a digital space is always the best way to invite someone into deeper and deeper into community so and this can happen at any level of technology you don't need to go out and start instagram accounts or discord servers this can all happen via email honestly um, it's more about recognizing how communication is different online and sort of what it does to people in relationship when there's a screen between people. Um, some things need to be tweaked a little bit, but you'd be surprised by how much is actually similar. In summation. I think this is you. Oh, it's me. All right. Digital ministry is important. It's not going away. It is real life and it's real worship. It's not second best. Um, it is the space where, where, it's only, where some people only feel safe right now. And we need to name that. And God calls us and it provides the way. And that God has been doing this for centuries. And, um, and, and showing us that welcome looks different in different contexts for centuries. You can read the book of Acts and see how Paul uh, was different to different people. Um, this has been happening and it will continue at, even if the, the medium changes. And welcome and evangelism and it's contextual. It looks different in different spaces, digital versus in person, rural versus suburban and urban. Um, these are all, uh, they're going to look different and don't think that necessarily our, our understanding is normative. Um, we have a very waspy Episcopalian culture that's not necessarily normative. And think through the three, the three T's, transfer, translate, and transformation. We've all pretty much got the transfer down. We, we did this. We did this back in March when everything shut down. But thinking at how to translate as we continue in digital spaces because it's not going away, or maybe even some transformation, like things that haven't even been done yet. We still have opportunities for that because we are on the frontier, like Oregon Trail, someone said in the chat a while back, which Ellie yeah. has no idea. It's the Oregon Trail generation understands that. So. We, we had access to that in the computer lab in like fifth grade. Okay, so good. I'm, I'm glad that they continued that. I, uh, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Probably because you had gen, like exennial orchid trial generation teachers or something. Um, anyway, uh, shepherding newcomers and community members through the social risk triangle into eventually co-creation. That's where our gifts and our callings are finally fully used. And that looks beautiful on a digital space as well as it does in, in analog community too. So. 
So we Yay. have next steps too, because we want to practice the same. We want to if model. you want to come on with us into deeper community, we've got an opportunity for you that's actually really cool. Um, so we've developed this boot camp that is four sessions long, and it is not webinars. It is like Zoom. We'll all talk to each other. Um, you want to give like the structure, Stephanie? Oh yeah. So we're um, we'll give you a. You can sign up. Um, we'll include the link on the um, on the follow up email for this. Um, and we'll do a little bit of prep work. Um, you'll have some homework. It's not nothing intense. It's watch or read some short things. Um, then we'll come together and we'll discuss that. And then we'll give you a little bit more content and a little bit more homework, kind of a flipped classroom model, which we're learning is one of the best ways to sort of do some formation. And we'll, we'll learn together. And we want that you have at least two people from a church so that you have somebody to, to bounce ideas off for your community. So am I forgetting anything about that? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, the sooner you sign up for that, the sooner we'll be able to send you the materials for the first session. Um, and again, it's not intimidating. Like I think we're Who the model does for this. Kind of scary. It right? Doesn't a... that sound scary? No, what we're doing is sort of sending up like a buffet of ways to dive into a topic. And then you can pick as many of those things or as few of those things to read and look at as possible. And then we'll come together and discuss how those ideas might be applicable in our very personal contextual spaces. Um, so it would be a great way to further develop how to take these ideas and apply them specifically to your community. And we'll be doing deep dives into transfer, translate, transformation, I think this is in the right order, I think it is, um, uh, throughout the weeks. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be able to dive deeper into some of these concepts. Awesome. Oh, Dawn is in. Yes. Yay. Ooh, go Dawn. Uh, okay. And so uh, we will share these slides in the recording with you. So don't worry. Um, that'll be in your follow up email. And before we close with a blessing, does anybody have any questions? In the chat or the Q&A. I guess those both would work. So very curious about boot camp possibilities. If you have any specific questions, you can also email uh, either of us. We'll have our emails in the follow-up email too. Nice. Yes, Peggy, Meredith, and Dawn, please join us. We have to talk about. <laughs> yeah, Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail. Yay. Yay, Hillary. Yes. Oh, it's going to be such a good party, you guys. It is. This boot camp. <laughs> I have so much fun. And nice. if, you, if you're in a community that needs a scholarship, there is a $30, $30 fee, $25, I don't remember how much. I think $30. $30 fee. Um, just send me an email and we'll work that out. We want, we want you to be able to, uh, we want you to have some skin in the game, but we also are, we, we want it to be open to anyone who wants interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so any questions about uh, what we've talked about today, about leading people further into community, about uh, what new opportunities there are um, in the world, permaculture, anything. We'll cover a lot more questions in the boot camp, but yeah. for those of you who don't want to, um, don't have time, something like that. Any other questions? And Ken, there will be an opportunity to sign up for the boot camp in the follow up email we'll send to all participants. Um, there's a link in the description of this webinar as well. You'll get the info, don't worry. Yes. We'll make sure you get it. Yeah. I think we can probably send them off with the blessing. Yeah, let's do yeah. it. All right. All right. It's a closing prayer, not opening prayer, but. Um, oh, I just copied the slide. It's all Whoops good. To do. It's all good. The Lord be with you and also with you. God, the creator and ruler of all things, your reign grows like a mustard seed into abundant life. Plant, bless those who plant and tend the new life of your church, that it may become a place of welcome, a refuge of healing, a school for souls, and a life-giving spring, all of which we ask through Jesus Christ, our strength and our salvation. Amen. Amen. You know what they say about how commencement is really the start 
of your life after school. Okay. Yeah. This is an opening prayer to the next, to your next, to your next. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Good, good call, Ellie. Thanks. Call. <laughs> well, thank all you right. all so much. We're so glad to do this. And we'll also share the, uh, Ellie's going to put it out on the diocesan YouTube page. So if you have uh, congregation members that might want to catch it, we can, we'll send it out. Yeah. Uh, it was really great to sort of, I see your textual names, I guess, not see your faces, unfortunately. Okay. That's my that's least favorite part of Zoom webinars. That's the first bit of the social risk triangle, It right? is. You guys are in the text level and we're inviting you into a visual community with each other. And then hopefully after that, we'll be able to co-create something out of what we develop. So it's going to be really, really cool. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys there. Thank you all.